Hello and welcome to my second workshop for the Scottish Fiddle Festival uh, on tune writing. Uh, this time I'm going to be looking at some techniques using rhythm to get you started uh, with a tune and to also help you build a tune. Uh, so uh, I mentioned in the first video using harmony to write a tune that I think all of music can be kind of like found in three categories and so one is the world of harmony, one's the world of melody and the other one's the world of rhythm and I think all of music kind of fits in one or two or three of these categories. So how can rhythm help you write a tune, you may be wondering. Um, well, just before I start, actually, I just want to say that I'm going to chuck out a whole pile of options. Uh, none of these are necessarily on their own going to help you. In fact, none of this might help you at all, but they are things that have helped me. And uh, I'm going to just serve them up. And it might be that maybe you only get like one single thing of use to you from this video or the other one. But uh, I would regard that as a success. If you do get one thing that helps you and it, and it really helps you, then that's great. Um, similarly, I don't think I would expect everyone to get every single thing completely taken aboard. And I don't expect every single thing I'm saying to necessarily resonate with people. But hopefully a wee bit here or there might just unlock some new melody in, in you. So yeah, that's my little disclaimer. Okay, so rhythm. What is rhythm? Uh, I'll tell you what it's not necessarily. Uh, rhythm isn't necessarily got any melody. It's not necessarily got any harmony. It's just it's the reason why drum kits don't have notes. Uh, rhythm is just this kind of uh, machine on which melody and harmony kind of sit and it's really rhythm is really a kind of a, a study of the passing of time as I suppose music is but rhythm is the dividing up of time so I'd like to just go straight in with looking at some tunes maybe that you already know and look at the rhythms that are already employed by these tunes and just ask yourselves what are they what are these rhythms? And do it kind of quite almost scientifically with an imaginary white lab coat on. Let's just go in and see what is that? So let's think of a really well known existing tune. I'm going to go straight for a Strathspey. Um, Strathspeys, of course, are famously rhythmic, and I believe that rhythm, as it's called the Scotch snap, uh, comes from the Gaelic language, where uh, words with two or more syllables generally have the emphasis on the first syllable and for example like the Gaelic for the word blue spelt G-O-R-M it's pronounced gorum and it's got this I believe it's called a joining vowel in between the R and M gorum brochen lom didum day lots of other Gaelic words so let's think of a stress bay. Uh, there's a great Strathspey that gets played over in Nova Scotia lots uh, for good reason, and it's called King George the Fourth. It's the first part on the back strings, as they say over there. of scotch snaps and it's also got towards the end of that first part it's got this classic run of four notes in quick succession anyone else have any problems playing those me i've always struggled with those we bit of a tip on those actually if you, if you want to get those four notes to come out i find it sometimes can help me is to dig in with the bow on the first of the four notes. That wasn't 
particularly nice sounding, but it was kind of working at some level. Okay, so the rhythm of King George IV, as I mentioned before, there's no sound, uh, so there's no pitch to the rhythm, so let's just take away the pitch. So what is the rhythm? Da dum da 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 um, by just getting you to do it. So let's take out those rhythms. Da dum dum da dee da da. And let's just immediately get away from A minor for a start. So you could do this. You could pick a tune, a Strathspey, or any type of tune. Look at the rhythm. Take away the pitches, the notes assigned to the rhythm. Take away the whole key, the whole harmonic feel of it and just change that variable to something completely different. So I'm going to do that just now. I'm going to just go, instead of being an A minor, let's do a Strathspey with this rhythm, uh, E major. Maybe, maybe, yeah, E major or E modal, which would have a D natural. Right, okay. So we're now in E, but we still don't have a tune. Okay, we'll get there. So let's just play lots of E's with the same rhythm of King George IV previously in A minor. Where's that sound like? It'll sound silly, and it should. <laughs> yeah, tune finished. Perfect. I love its melodic ups and downs. No, <laughs> tune obviously not finished. But what we've done there is we've just kind of, by playing that E, we've just kind of got our head a little bit into E. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to do is look at the notes available in the key of E modal. So again, this is now bringing in a little bit of harmony. So we're in E. So I'm just going to go through the scale of E major, just go, what are my options? Because when you're writing your tunes, I think it helps to be thoroughly aware at all times of what your options are when you're deciding what to do with a tune. It's really good. Just like an artist is looking at their palette of colours, you want to know what, what are my options here. So let's look at our options. We're in E. Okay. E is an option, the key of E. The major second in E, that interval, is F sharp in this key. And then because we're in E major, the third of the scale is a major third. That's the happy note. And then we've got an A natural the fourth of the scale and the fifth of the scale is B. So you're already starting to get a kind of feel for the harmonic sound of E and doesn't it immediately sound different to A minor? Next note in E major a C sharp that's the major six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, I wasn't quite sure where to go for E major or E modal. If this was a class situation, I would make you vote on it. Uh, I think we'll just go for E modal. Uh, a tune writer who is making judicious use of E modal uh, at the moment uh, is Kevin Henderson, fiddle player from Shetland, um, who is world leader, global leader in key of E modal, uh, with such hits as Thompson's Trip to Talon Island. <laughs> <laughs> Love 
Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, kid. So, we're going to go for E modal. So, what are our options? <laughs> There and of course we can keep going a bit in slow in first position. And if you want to stay in first position, which it's up to you, I'm going to keep it there for now because it's E modal with a flat in seventh. That also means that, that D natural occurs everywhere. So that's our other option. I must keep going down and staying in the key of E major. That's an interesting option, isn't it? <laughs> Just trying to think of Strath Spades that are in the key of E major that have... I'm sure there must be a few out there. But that one, personally, that's just kind of making me go... I like that. So really, maybe what I should be asking you to do is not just run through the options of the key you're in, but, I don't know, listen to your own feelings uh, on the matter. Are there any notes or things that are starting to catch your ear? Oh, I like that. So, run through the notes. So yeah, you could actually, if you want to, just get familiar with the mode that you're in. Just run up and down, get comfy. And again, just listen, see if anything's, any notes are taking your fancy. And when you've done that for a bit, uh, you could just kind of return, return to the rhythm. And we're gonna see if we can kind of bring together these two worlds, okay? So what have we got? Let's remind ourselves again of our other colors in our palette, the rhythm. King George IV rhythm, N E, and uh, it might help you to write this down. You could get if you use the music notating program Sibelius or good old pen and paper, pencil and paper. You could just write down the rhythm of this on one line, just to keep you keep you right. So. As I said before, that is not really complete as a melody, but now we have a bit more familiarity with our harmonic options. So we're starting to kind of get ready to have a go at the most exciting bit of writing a tune, I think, which is getting the all important opening phrase. The opening phrase, I have, if you've been in my classes before, you'll know I call it the seed phrase because that's where everything comes from. It is your opening statement. It is the most powerful phrase in any tune, I think. It is the first thing. And it's that phrase which is gonna catch someone's ear or not. It's just so much fun. This is you throwing paint at the easel. Uh, so, the reason that I'm chucking out the idea of using rhythm is because getting this first phrase is so it, it can be tricky particularly if you don't really have anything just entering your head who has that all the time i know i don't but this is a way of kind of jump starting your own creative process um so we're jump starting it by we've already decided something we've decided it's a strat B. You've decided it's in 4-4, four, four. you've decided it's got a certain rhythm. So by making those decisions, by forcing those decisions upon your creative process, you don't have time to decide whether or not you have some kind of writer's block because you've just completely pulled a fast one on your own creativity and said, oh, writer blo writer's block. Sorry, we've actually already started writing this tune. It's already started. Catch up, please. Okay. So now it's just a question of like, well, what notes are we going to assign to the rhythm that we've already picked? I haven't got any idea what I'm going to chuck out just now. I'm just going to chuck some notes to this rhythm. And I don't really care 
what comes out. This is just the creative stage. This is the first stage. And in this stage, I would urge you all to have the same attitude, almost belligerent attitude to whatever comes out at this stage. Don't care. I would definitely urge you not, not to care. This has to be a chilled out, nice, fun playground. You've got to be the child in the playground here, not, not the adult. So who cares what happens here? You should care as much as a child cares about how effectively they are playing with their toys because you are just trying to be as playful as that. Okay, so with that, I will not care about what I do, but I will make it stick to the rhythm. a little bit of King George IV vaguely reminiscent but you can see uh, uh, first of all there's a million different things you can do and that should be a fun thing lots of fun um, and also you can see how you can actually pretty like pretty easily get away from the worry of plagiarizing King George IV you have to be pretty stingy to say that all oh, that was exactly a rip off Plus, if it does bother you, you can just gently change things so that it's further and further away. So, the opening phrase, I just literally just went bleh, and just chucked out lots of things there. Um, I don't know if that's original or not. And normally the question of whether or not it's original or not, for me, is... Unless it's immediately obvious that it's like something else, I tend to just worry about that later on. At this stage, I just want to get something that I like. And that's what I think you should do. At this stage, you are looking for something that you like. It's, I use way too many metaphors in life, but I'm going to use another one here. It's kind of like sifting, panning for gold. You're just looking. What do I like? What do I like? And looking for something shiny. And um, that's what I do anyway. So I'm going to just stick with this rhythm and just try a few more things and see if I can kind of settle on one. And again, who cares? I seem to be settling on... Which just reminds you... So let's just say I'm happy with my first opening phrase. Let's check you're happy. I'm going to chuck in another technique here, which is if you think you've got your opening phrase or you're not sure, but you have something, this is what I do is I play that a bazillion times. A bazillion times. And what that quite often does for me is it it gets, well, first of all, you, you, you learn how to play it. And by playing it again and again and again and again, what you're not doing is you're not furiously, egotistically trying to get an answer phrase or the next phrase or finish the part or finish the tune. You're not even trying to finish the tune. You just by playing it, that first phrase again and again and again and again, you're letting it sink in. You're making friends with this little seed phrase. And then what I found is if I play it a bazillion times, eventually, or not even eventually, fairly soon, I get frustrated with this playing this blooming one phrase again and again and again. So what do you do when you get frustrated about this one phrase and getting bored of playing it again and again? 
Well, I'd recommend that you keep playing it again and again and again. Not, not even though, because you're bored of it, I would say to you, counterintuitive, keep blimmin' playing it. Why? Because you'll just start to get really, really angry <laughs> if you really persist with it. Oh my God. And that can sometimes, for me anyway, mean that the answer phrase after this original question, the answer phrase is like just desperate to get out, to be part of this. And by holding it back, when you finally let it rip, I find for me that answer phrase is just like comes bursting into the room. And it's quite often as a result a, a strong answer phrase. Uh, the opposite of that would be me writing my first phrase, not playing it nine times, immediately trying to get some kind of answer phrase. But it might be, it works out okay, but it might be weaker because I haven't really gotten to know my first phrase yet. I haven't really got myself rooted in this. Whereas if you're really firmly rooted in your opening phrase and you're playing it again and again, the answer is going to be more obvious because you're, I guess, more familiar with the question. I'm not sure how often I should sit and play this opening phrase for you just now. I'll just buy it for it. Maybe you at home are sitting there right now hearing something in your head as an answer phrase. Did you hear anything there? That's another wee tip actually, just there, if you want an answer phrase, you can just play the question and then listen. Um, listen, when I say listen, I mean, do you hear anything coming? It might not be a fully formed phrase, but it might just be the faintest little slither of melody. And uh, that little slither of melody maybe would have been drowned out were you not giving yourself a little bit of space. So this is another technique for getting your second phrase. Play your opening phrase and listen. What am I hearing? Um, I've done this a few times and I've heard, when I've listened really hard, I've heard stuff that's almost like so incredibly quiet. It's just like, wait, wait, wait. And it's stuff that I'm like, what is that? And I, I've kind of had to kind of grab it and bring it into this tune and then once I've learned it I kind of think well I don't think I would have added that to the tune if I hadn't made a bit of space just to listen for a second so yeah it's almost like some bit of you might be trying to communicate an idea to the tune and you maybe just have to make a bit of space just to listen to it so doing that can be So I just heard, no, or something like I, Went a bit nuts with digga 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 digga. but that was just uh, yeah you can you can have a bit of fun I'm still at the stage of chucking things at the canvas okay so we've uh, looked at a few different ways to get started on a strath spade rhythm could have been any type of tune but fundamentally we started off with an existing rhythm in a tune that's uh, well loved tried and tested and we know that the rhythm for that tune is, is a winner but when we change the key to get away to a totally different colour set of colours and we just start putting different notes and different phrasing 
Ähm, okay. A little thing here. Um, the last notes of, of your phrases, uh, this isn't particularly to do with uh, rhythm here, but it's just a wee tip. There's a huge amount of power in the last note of phrases. I'll show you what I mean here. I don't necessarily particularly like that, but I'm just doing it to show you. Finishing that D. It's unresolved. It's finishing the question. But the second time you change that note to an E. So the first time. to finish on an E so you can have a contrasting uh, effect in a tune by burying the last notes and also the last note in a part or a phrase can take you off somewhere new so I'm going to use that here to show you another tip for tune writing which might help you if you've written a first part of a tune and you're kind of stuck ever had that first part of a tune so excited so excited Woo! -hoo! Don't know where to go now. Oh no, I've only written half a tune and all that nice feeling of excitement just kind of starts to deflate. So here's how we cheat to maybe get out of that and it's to use to tinker with the last note. So let's see. Um, let's say I'm going to just change. Let, I've kind of got a very rough sketch of this first part. I've slightly abandoned the King George IV rhythm to the letter and uh, that's okay because I don't have to stick to it. So you can do that too. If your tune starts to wander off somewhere else, that's cool, that's quite exciting. The point was that you got started. So, last note of the first part, change, see if we can go somewhere else. My mind kind of wanted off them. Um... Oh, crumbs, didn't like that, but it had some kind of effect. So it's not going. That takes us up there. So maybe our beat part's gonna start there. Fluffing away here, doesn't have to sound good, you're just going blah. Now change the last note to end up with a start of a B part. And just to make the um, point, I'm going to try and finish this first part with a different last note. So I kind of went off down to instead of going, I went. That kind of modulating to a D thing. <laughs> See what I mean? So try mucking around with the last notes and see where it takes you. Um, okay, so more recapping. Strathspey, abandon the original key, abandon the original notes, new key, new notes. 
muck around, see what comes out, don't be precious, be like a child playing with their toys, have fun, uh, be as carefree and kind to yourself in your, in your inner mind as possible, don't be judgmental, don't be expectant of something good, because expecting something good is just like the most annoying thing. Imagine being, imagine you were that person in someone else's creative process and you heard someone writing a tune and you said, um, um, I, I think maybe you should be very concerned about how good this tune is. It's like, woo, deflate, deflate. That's an ego thing. Everyone's got an ego. I have an ego. It's been the biggest thing to get in the way of my creative process and uh, <laughs> the more often you can disengage that the better. Your ego might look like a worry about whether it's good or not. Ego isn't always someone puffing themselves up, it might be a kind of negative ego, it might be like oh I'm worried about it's good or I'm worried if it's like something else or or whatever or maybe I don't have the right to be doing this or any of these things. You want to just kind of try and cheekily bypass that and just get to the fun bit of just going, well, I'm just gonna chuck some stuff, doesn't matter. And to get to that place, maybe it might be, you might have to try and find some space. Maybe you wanna try and find a place where no one can hear you. Or if someone can hear you, you might have to try and find the strength to just not care. Or even ask them, do you care about what I sound like? And hopefully they'll say, frankly, not really. Probably, that will probably be their answer. Okay. So you can do this with reels, jigs. I could go about this, go about this all day. I just went with a strass bay to kind of use it as a vehicle. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit now, I'm gonna just abandon that strass bay. That's off now. Uh, I'm gonna look at uh, a different area of rhythm study that I have found has ended up with kind of launching me off into some unexpected tunes. And that's learning about rhythms that I don't understand. Um, so, first time I heard the Mike McGoldrick band, I was 18 and I got the record uh, and there was this tune in 7 8 and I just didn't get it at all. And I was like, what is that? Is it a real? Is it a jig? Somewhere in between. But I knew I liked it. It was like, it had this appeal of like, whoa. So, I spent ages trying to just understand how it worked. I was started off just trying to count to seven every bar. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. And that, <laughs> that wasn't really working. And um, after much kind of uh, dining out in my own head of working out what the heck this was, I kind of made this, for me, breakthrough, which was that it was easier if you divided it into groups of two and three. Um, so like seven, in groups of two and three. It's some really simple primary school maths. Two plus two plus three is seven. And that's one way of grouping seven. Or it could be three plus two plus two. Or it could be two plus three plus two. There is no other combination of twos and threes. That's it. Um, how can this help you write a tune? Well, for me, just uh, similar to what we did in the Stras Bay was I, I just got so into the rhythm of it. I was like kind of body tapping and all that all over the place and annoying people I live with and being weird in supermarkets and stuff. Um, but I ended up getting getting it one day and went, whoa. And then a tune just kind of attached itself in my head to this rhythm that I'd kind of gotten the hang of and it's just a great way to to write a tune is to pick a rhythm perhaps that maybe you haven't really thought about before so or even if you have but if you if you ever thought about seven eight you could do the same thing that I was asking you to for Strass Bay to write down your rhythms on a bit of paper you could really just write down a rhythm so what's a seven eight rhythm Let's go for one, two, one, two, one, two, three. So that's just like one, did, 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 
and the one in each little subgrouping is the note is the, is the one that you want to keep track of one two one two one two three dun 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 and that's like the strong beat one two one two one two three one two one two one two three I've heard that uh, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe they simply call it short short long short short long one two one two one two three one two one two one two three so once you get through the maths you can maybe start pick up your fiddle see if you can just play something really simple in seven eight just a wee ditty you could pick a key uh, let's just pick d so what are the notes in d One, two, one, two, one, two, three. Okay, I want to pick out the ones in each subgrouping. So I can make the simplest one could be one, two, one, two, one, two, a bit of a 7-8 journey there, starting simple, wandering around. Um, so it could be 7-8, it could be 5-8, it could be 13-8, you can just pick the rhythm. It could be a march, you could pick an existing march, you could pick like... Pick a different key. Uh, interestingly enough, must be like the most popular way to start a march. You might want to consider not having dum hiddy as the start of your march. Or there's lots of these. You could try and think out of the box. What would be a weird start to a march? <laughs> Horrible, but fun uh, to try. Okay, so I'm just going to re recap here. Um, there were so many more things I wanted to cover. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts or anything you want to share um, with me about tune writing generally, um, please get in touch. I'm more than happy to help. Uh, my main thing would be writing a tune should be for you. And it should be fun for you and your enjoyment is absolutely paramount at the center of it and at times you can share it with someone else at times you can 
take on board other people's opinions and you should be wise to do so but it's your thing at the center of it um, by that same token don't be overly precious about your ideas there's a kind of balance in there somewhere uh, I hope that my ramblings over these past two workshops I hope that uh, maybe even one little thing might have struck home and may, might be of some assistance um, even if that's something maybe you already knew but you just kind of felt like reaffirmed or something like that um, so I wish everyone here in the workshop all the very very best of luck uh, go and have fun write in your tunes try something you haven't done before whether it's a new rhythm or a new key try and break out of your normal sphere and uh, I will say cheerio for now and I want to thank the Scottish Fiddle Festival uh, thank you very very much Rosie and all the staff there for inviting me along to do this workshop and uh, bye for now